my name is Glenda McKay, and I'm Ingaluk Athabaskan from Alaska. Uh, we live about 150 miles north of Anchorage, which is in Talkeetna, Alaska. Um, that's where my mail comes. We still live 25 miles further in the mountains. I've lived in Alaska my whole life. I've been beading and skin sewing since I was very small. My aunts and, and mom and them were very adamant about us learning how to survive off the land. So I learned at a very young age how to snare animals and uh, tan their hides in order to make smaller pieces of clothing. And um, it was just to, to teach us the survival skills. Um, we learned the plant life and the medicinal parts of life, the roots and stuff like that, and what to survive on. Um, my aunt was very adamant about us learning all this and my, my family. They were worried that we would be invaded again by the Russians. So they wanted to make sure we could go into the mountains and live off the land and not have to worry about anything. And I guess that's where my interest in making the weapons and stuff like that, other than I do a miniature. We lived in Anchorage for a few years and I told him one, I said, let's sell everything we have and let's move to my property. And he said, um, what will we do? I said, we could live off of my crafts. And so when we moved out there, we worked uh, quite a bit, both of us, making different things and selling them. And one day he was carving a little umiak, and I said, well, let me, see. he said, wouldn't it be neat if some little men could be in there? So I grabbed a bucket of scrap leather, and the very first doll was an inch and a half tall. <clears throat> I just threw something together. I still have the piece I call him Frankenstitch, because he said you see every stitch on him. Um, and then I put little men in there, and then how the dolls got to be as tall as they are, he was carving a kayak. And I said, well, let me try to put a little half a man on it instead of you carving a man. Let me sew a little man together and carve his face. And his body was a little bit too tall, so I set him aside, and I went ahead and finished the piece. And then when I was looking at the one, I thought, well, I'll make some pants, and I got my grandmother's muckluck pattern out. And I grafted it down small enough to fit the doll, and I matched the, put my feet to, in, to my hands, and I matched the doll's hands to their feet, and pretty much have them to my height, other than they're small. And I, the first doll came to be, and that's how they've got to be as tall as they are. The dolls I started making, actually in selling, was in 2002. I've been making stuff all along, so things have been made since I was a very young age all the way up to now. So I just started showing professionally at museum shows in 2006. I've won 23 ribbons in that amount of time. Um, what I use for my dolls is seal skin, um, beaver, I'll have some polar bear on them, fossilized whalebone, uh, new whale baleen and walrus ivory. I use a lot of fossilized ivory too. So I do all my own carving and my own hunting for food and then what I don't eat is used for clothing or art. Um, everything gets used, nothing goes to waste. It isn't hunted just for the hide. Um, one hide will make many, many pieces. So I don't, I don't hunt for just that. I hunt for the food part of it. I've done many shows through here, and um, we would stop and stay with friends every now and then. We've stayed on the reservation with a few friends for a few times, so we're pretty, we know a little bit of the area, and it's pretty fascinating to see different areas. I hadn't been out of Alaska much of my life until I started doing the shows, and since then my husband and I have traveled across the United States 26 times driving. We try to take a different route each time so that we can see more and it's amazing how Mother Nature can make such beauty <laughs> everywhere. At first when I seen the deserts I was thinking, what do these people eat? And I've talked with quite a few medicine women in other tribes and stuff and it's amazing what is out there. So I try to learn even down here the the type of lifestyle and stuff too and what they ate and how they foraged and because um, if anything does happen if I'm not home at least I'll be able to survive here too. <laughs> Through the shows um, doing like the Herd Museum and Santa Fe Market I was approached many times to apply for the grants here but I never really had a resume or anything put together and I had to, I'd never been a part of it so I'd got some help with friends and putting together the, the right credentials and stuff and I was very surprised I got it and very happy this place is awesome um, I have no wants or needs everything you could possibly want is here 
I would love to have a studio like this full time <laughs> and a house like this full time. But um, I've got, was able to get a lot of stuff done and I hope to get a lot more done before it's over with. Um, we'll be finishing a doll called the Basket Maker, but her baskets will be made out of walrus stomach. Um, and she'll be beaded, she'll be out of seal skin and um, smoked deer hide. And um, they're even stuffed with whale baleen shavings. So the only thing store-bought are the beads and the thread. And um, she'll have a few baskets beside her and she'll be working on a basket. And then she'll have her little tool tray and stuff beside her too. I started the doll in March before I got here. As soon as I found out I, I received the grant, I started working on the piece because there's no way I could finish it in two months time. The dolls will take anywhere from three months up to two years, depending on what type of implements are with them. So um, everything is done by hand. All the carving is done with knives, files, and sandpaper. And so it, it takes time to, to go through and make the stuff. I love the challenge of being able to make something that small and to see if I can do it and it look right and fit with the, the size of the piece. Most of my tools are just knives and files. I use a lot of uh, little uh, tweezers and stuff and homemade tools. But uh, right now I was currently working on this doll here and I've got the top part of her finished. And then next I'll be putting her pants and mucklucks all together. I still have to do her mucklucks and sew them together. And she'll be holding a basket that she'll be sewing and I've got that pretty much done with the caribou sinew string in it and then a little tiny ivory needle here will be in her hand and she'll be sitting on a base and she'll have her tools and stuff around her and a few baskets already made and she'll be working on a basket. Some of the furs and stuff that I use, um, there's sea otter and then there's brain tan smoked deer hide, a bleach seal skin, which is a traditional sew material for the mucklucks um, seal skin polar bear hair, wolverine, marten, and ermine, and then Alaska mink. And a lot of the mammoth ivory and stuff, my husband and I find. Um, we do a lot of river rafting, and we find things after high water along the rivers. And then there's fossilized whalebone that is used for the bases of the dolls. And it's very heavy. It's already turned to stone, and that's what her stand was cut off of. This is a bison bone, and it was from the Palo period. We have fossilized walrus teeth, which I use for a lot of the faces. And then there's walrus ivory. This is about six and a half pounds of ivory, and they have two of these, and this is it goes up in his skull about this far. When you see the head mounts, all you're seeing is the two tusks and the nose bone. Their skull is a lot bigger further back. And they're actual miniature replicas of uh, traditional pieces from a long time ago. Some are still being used. Um, I use fossilized ivory and mammoth ivory and caribou sinew. Um, like even the bows and arrows, they'll actually work. The little bird bolos, everything is replicated of actual pieces. And then these are some more styles of the baskets that I make. These I dyed with uh, blueberries. I dyed the walrus stomach with blueberries, which took, it was about a 10 step process. You can't let it soak too long because it'll get really slimy. So you soak it for a while and I rinse it till it's clean and let it dry and then I'll soak it in the berries again and rinse it till it's, it's a long process till I get it to the color that I want it. The red dots on them are cranberry dyed seal intestines. So everything gets used, everything. And then this is actually the stand and what the doll that I'm working on will be set up and in here's some of her tools. She has um, a stitch gauge, an extra needle, and then a punch, sinew, walrus stomach, bleach seal skin, and the ivory ulu in her little work basket. And then she'll have these two finished baskets beside her while she's working on another one. This one is shaman carving his own image. This one's guardian of the north. This is a miniature rain parka made out of walrus stomach, and then it's got uh, the buried 
dyed seal intestine medallion and porcupine quills. And then the center one is called Shaman Talks. And then the one on the end is Oh Great One. And then the masks are all miniature replicas of actual masks. Some are storytellers, um, Mother of the Mosquitoes, Owl Mask, and then the Bear Man Mask. Um, we believe everything has a spirit, so you treat everything with respect, um, whether it's a grain of sand or a leaf or a person. Everything has a human spirit, so you have to respect everything. There's an octopus bag on the wall, which is an authentic Athabascan piece. Um, it was the first full-size piece I've done for competition. And it has size 22 beads up to size 11. And this is a walrus ivory hummingbird that I carved. And it has 74 mammoth ivory beads that are hand done. And it's lined with a brain tan smoked deer hide. And then I put seal skin on the back. And these are a traditional bag. I finished the piece. <clears throat> Um, this is the basket maker, and since you were here, I'd put her together. Um, her bottom and stuff was ready. I was ready to put her together, and I inserted her heart. And then Friday morning, my husband and I had our normal little ceremony um, that I do with every doll and her little blessing and positioned her. All her little tools are in her basket from extra needles and leather punches and gauges and ulus and extra walrus stomach for making baskets and beads. We make baskets for different things, so I just figured, why not make a basket maker? She has hair barrettes that are tied in with caribou sinew. And the string attached to the basket, she's stitching the last bead on the basket with sinew and an ivory needle. Even her little tray basket is out of walrus stomach. And then I use pinking shears to do the rickrack for the border around that basket too. Mm -hmm. And these beads actually show the actual size of the beads that are on her. Those are sink beads singly. She does her hair is um, real hair. Um, I haven't been to the village for a long time and uh, there's a lot of villages that are still pretty secluded. In fact, you would have to be invited to come there. Um, I have never made it to the actual village where my grandmother was from or my mom was from. Um, we don't have reservations in Alaska, we have corporations, so people are pretty much scattered. I grew up in Chugiak, which was about 25 miles north of Anchorage, and back then it was very secluded. Um, we very seldom went into Anchorage. I grew up mostly in Denali Park. My aunts and them, every summer, we'd spend the summers out there. That was before it was a park. Um, they still have a lot of their homesteads out there. So Only the Alaska Natives can hunt a lot of the, the, the sea life, like seal and the walrus and the whale and stuff like that. I hunt, do my own hunting for the seal and the otter and a lot of the furs that you'll be seeing. Um, the whale and the walrus, it's cousins and friends, I'll get stuff from them or my brother. Um, if I help clean some animals, I get some pieces of them. During the uh, Japanese war, a lot of the people were rounded up and put in concentration camps, and so the language was pretty much stopped. Um, they'd even gone so far as, um, it was pretty brutal on them for them to stop them from speaking the language. So I never learned it. I, I have talked to a few elders about, they are starting to record CDs and stuff to learn the language. So hopefully we'll be able to speak it more. They were put in concentration camps, I guess, because they thought they looked so much alike. One time uh, I was very small when my grandmother passed away and I asked why she didn't speak it and she said she had no one to talk to. The dolls were never this detailed. Um, the dolls would usually be made as a teaching tool um, to where we would make, do our own tanning and stuff and make clothing for the dolls to learn how to make clothing for ourselves. So they, the dolls were never really a toy. They, everything was a teaching tool. Even the games were teaching tools for dexterity and stuff like that. So. Um, but I was told that the dolls hadn't been made that small since the 20s and they weren't to that detail. Um, each doll I make, I try to make it um, in remembrance of someone or from stories that were told to me. 
so that they depict an actual ceremony or scene or something that happened in my life. I've gone, made them smaller. I've never made them any larger than the, their five and a half to six inches is what they are. The, the smallest were an inch and a half tall. I haven't made any that small in a long time. I, I am working on one I have for quite a while that'll be about two inches tall, maybe with the fur rough. <laughs> It's exciting. Um, I like doing it. It's very enjoyable. It's tedious at times uh, if things don't work out, but I'll keep working at them until I can get it figured out. Um, if I can't figure it out, then it'll be put aside for a while and I'll go back to it. But um, that's usually just on the experimental part of things. Um, I did make a doll many, many years ago and it was I used the doll as a practice piece and then once I got things perfected I took the doll apart so I had no more bad spirits to, to follow me. I not only work on the dolls when I'm in a good mood and stuff because I don't want any bad feelings or bad spirits going into the dolls. I want them to be good. From what I've been told Navajo Athabascans are pretty much cousins. Um, there's theories of them coming down, theories of us going up and bands dropping off, so I think we're all related anyway. But it's, it's pretty neat to see the different cultures and stuff down here too, the, the different style of art. Um, we were on the Santo Domingo Reservation for a while with friends and it's amazing all the stuff that, that is done in preparation to make things as well with them as with us too. So.